you can't have more fun than drawing pictures and pissing people off. It's, uh, it's way better than passive ag aggression. It's just plain aggression. <laughs> There is a First Amendment, and the way you find out there's a First Amendment is you go through 13 years of federal court, and you get convicted of trademark violation, copyright infringement, business disparagement, unfair competition, and aggravated assault on Mickey Mouse. I don't exactly remember how I met O'Neill, <laughs> but I knew about him before I met him. I'd, I'd seen some of his work in the Chronicle, and I immediately thought, well, this is pretty edgy stuff. I don't really have anything against him, and I don't care if my children's marry up with their children, and I don't care who runs the politics or business and all that what my friends is worried about. I just enjoys whooping peoples and beating and lynchings and all that. I hid that cartoon and 40 papers dropped overnight. O'Neill really was the ringleader on this. He had had this comic strip with the San Francisco Chronicle called Odd Bodkins, and he was fired three times, and I guess the last time stuck, and he decided that he was going to make some waves in the world. I mean, the war was going on, and it was an anti-military industrial complex kind of statement to go after Walt Disney. People aren't as worried about Disney now, you know, as they were during our era, because we were coming out of a, of a counterculture movement. Everything was suspect that Disney was a ripe target for that period, for what was happening. The challenge against American culture and values and what had got us into the Vietnam War and that mindset, that mentality. And Disney perpetuated that way of thinking. Dan basically was angry at the cover-up. It was this like nice little perfect world in which everybody said hello to everybody and shook hands and got along. And there were evil entities that would try to take your money and then Mickey Mouse is always on the side of good. They take over your imagination. We'll imagine this for you. And it wasn't real. Mickey Mouse started out as the American who was scrappy and fighting everything, and then they turned him into a CIA agent. And they put long pants on him, and they were just the corporate fascist bigoted empire. <laughs> you know what I mean? So it was Dan's idea. We were gonna be the first underground cartoon studio. Francis Coppola had this warehouse. I'd worked for him in City Magazine, so we had this warehouse that we're renting. And then I got all the cartoons that nobody else wanted. Gary Halgren, who had the brush, and Bobby London, who the pin line, and Sherry Flanagan, Ted Richards. That's what it took to get that Disney line. Using the old Disney tools, using a Coke wheel pin and brush, and we got in the studio and learned how to draw. We had like, you know, you'd call it an art salon like they have in France, uh, in San Francisco, where we were all learning to do cartoons at the same time and kind of all learning and all teaching each other. We were in there for nine months and we produced about 17 comic books. We were doing parody, we were doing satire, trying to get busted. It was basically smut and Mickey going down on Minnie and if I did it the other way around, nobody would have noticed. But Actually, a woman saying, me first? This was big news in 1971. 
Dan had this idea to hire winos and dress them up in police uniforms and have them like laying around San Francisco all day and distribute our comic books. That was going to be our distribution system. We put them in the airports and trying everything to get their attention. Then my lawyer, Mike Kennedy, had a big dinner of all of his clients, all the commies in Hollywood. Abby Hoffman, Jerry Rubin, and Huey Newton, and the Mitchell Brothers, and me. And next to me is this kid who's the son of the chairman of the board of Disney, but since he's gay, they've sentenced him to a bookstore in San Francisco. And so he takes the comic books down and puts one all around the board of directors. That's how he got it in there. Disney went bananas. <laughs> And then it went. We were listed in the yellow pages as Air Pirates Secret Hideout. And then the Pinkertons finally looked in the phone book and found us. <laughs> it took 20 minutes to convict me of five federal crimes. So I got my Easy Rider jacket, my Jack Palance gunfighter hat and an empty holster with a belt. So I go through security, get in the elevator, and I'm strapping that holster on. And then I step out of the elevator. The biggest U.S. Marshal, he had to be nine feet tall. He jumps over his desk, grabs me with his left hand by the neck, lifts me up off the ground. Security, security. There's a, a guy up here. With a... And my coat falls open and there's a banana. Guy up here with a banana. And I'm going, it's a chiquita. It's a chiquita. There was what they call a summary judgment, which told these guys not to publish any more comic books. So everyone was scared away by that, except O'Neill, who was out on the East Coast organizing artists to support their cause. I am guilty. First I'm convicted in the Ninth Circuit, then I'm convicted in the appellate, and then I'm convicted in the Supreme Court of the United States. And I owe them a $195,000 fine, up to a year in federal prison, and the lawyer's fees to catch me, another 10 million. There was some victory there. It opened up the door that you can do a one-time direct parody. Before that, it was like you had to do like Mickey Rat, you know, Mickey Moose or, you know. What we were able to break through with is that a parody can use the actual materials. You can do Mickey Mouse sucks and that's it. That's one piece that appeared in one piece of media. You can't just take the copyrighted material and then own it for yourselves and go into business. If you look at the Air Pirate Funnies, you could subscribe. <laughs> the court says, you can print 25,000 copies. You have to tear them all up except one. So I can make one mouse work. They said, yes. So I went out and I got 10,000 artists to make one mouse work. Every artist in the world, here's a shot at Disney, and they all did one. We ran it on the trains as advertising materials, and this show went across the country. Michelangelo Mouse, Dolly Mouse, and they were all signed with numbers. You didn't know their names. They had MLF and then a number. We had 50 brigades. I had an army. Number one from the MLF. Welcome to our little farms, Minnie and Mickey there. Yes, friends, it's true. We are Mr. and Mrs. Mickey Mouse. Strangely enough, it was our kidnap by the air pirates that brought us together. The Air Pirates started down that long road to the Supreme Court, insisting their Hell Comics was parody. We were not unfortunately surprised at the court's decision. It's taken the court over 200 years to discover that Negroes are people, and they're only half sure about women, and they've never heard of Indians. So how do we expect them to understand mice? The courts said the Air Pirates, with great precision and accuracy, took too much of the original when affecting their parody. No one, including the court, is sure how much is some. Some says the court is okay. Here's Mickey with a big rat tail. Is this some? 
folks out there what it means when the Supreme Court says, I am not a parody. It means, folks, that Disney wins. The Supreme Court guarantees that the mouse before you is my dad, the one and only Mickey Mouse, not a parody. I told them I was a parody. And they said, no, it's a real Mickey Mouse. So okay. Signing off, we hope we brought you some understanding of parody. We in this communique by elevating to a true irony the preceding comic strip is a federal crime. Contempt of the Supreme Court of the United States. Contempt makes it a felony. And now we can get to what it's all about, the First Amendment. The judge was Wallenberg, and he was the last judge appointed by Roosevelt. And he says to Disney, well, you have him in here on felony contempt of the Supreme Court. Now that it's a felony, he gets a quick and speedy trial. And he gets to bring in the First Amendment as a defense, which he was unable to do under civil law. And then what he said next is the most important thing I ever heard about the Constitution or the Bill of Rights. He says, to discuss the First Amendment is to weaken it. If there wasn't a First Amendment, then I'd be in jail and I'd owe $10 million. I said, here's the deal. You tell us that we can't draw a mouse and we probably will. You tell us that we can, and we probably won't. Freedom of speech is exactly that. Satire, parody, that's not piracy. They folded, they folded. And um, I had a promise not to draw no more mouses. So I did a picture of me naked in a barrel. I'm not gonna draw no more mouses, the judge cracked up. Disney was really pissed off. <laughs> The satirist can cause people to laugh about important people or so-called important events. You can cause them to see that they are either hypocritical, not truthful, dangerous, but you, you bring out that something is really wrong here. You have to be critical. Ronnie Reagan's asshole is rotten to the core. Ronnie Reagan's asshole is rotten to the core. Ronnie Satire is the deadliest art, according to the Irish. The You're going after the powerful. God doesn't have a chance either, you know. You've all heard of the Irish Republican Army. San Francisco has an Irish Republican Navy here in Sausalito. They're massing a protest against the Queen. Let's find out what's happening. Dan O'Neill, you created the Irish Republican Navy in your comic uh, strip, or what are your cartoon strip in the Chronicle, right? Yeah, and then it came true. Uh, one of the boats sunk. Well, most of them are still in the water. So you hope that the seagulls shit on the Queen? At least one. You can't get everything in this world. The French bread floats on the water, and there'd be about eight miles of seagulls for her to come through. Don't you think that's a little bit sick, having seagulls fly over the head of the queen when she's coming into San Francisco? She could get, you know, Let's hit. hope so. I mean, one can get lucky. That's the way the Irish are. One will get lucky. For us, as young cartoonists, we took a risk. We jeopardized our careers. You know, we weren't going to do children's books. We weren't going to have daily comic strips. We were right on the edge, with no compensation to speak of. No one made any money on this, OK, to this date. But we took a chance. So you take a chance. That's the message. I keep reminding people that people died to say the F word. We didn't have that kind of freedom of speech. That was important then. It's not so important now. I think there's something else to say now. For a lot of our younger people right now, the whole economy isn't working for them. You have something far more dangerous than a Disney world. You've got a Disney world coupled with a autocracy and literally criminal business. That's what you're facing. Since I tussled with them, eight corporations own everything and three corporations own those eight corporations and Disney's one of those three. So you have an organism that's just a big giant thing that has to have more profit every year and so there's no controlling any of these entities. If you did anything with Mickey Mouse, they sue you, and they still will, because they figure they can wear you out in court. 
you go to court within four or five years, you will prevail. But they'll run you through that, even though they know that they're wrong. You know, I'm open, somebody can satirize me, and I can't stop it. Good luck. Ha, 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 ha.